Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell, and I am here today with a really unique airplane, the P-63, the King Cobra. I'm going to tell you about how this airplane came to be. Uh, it is one of a, it is design derivative of the uh, P-39, the Air Cobra, the Bell Air Cobra, and, uh, but no, no relationship there, uh, Greg. Now, the interesting thing is today is the week of Thanksgiving, and Mr. Kenny, Mr. Kenny, my super incumbent, my super incumbent assistant, which I have no idea what that means, uh, has picked out a nice hat. I will give you the the profile. Uh, I hope you, you are going to eat me this week, are you? You know, but um, he brought me a nice turkey hat in honor of uh, Thanksgiving. So there you go. Another nice catch by the drumstick from Mr. Kenny. Now, the P-63 is an interesting airplane in that um, it came out of a frantic design race that was going up into the uh, start of World War II. You have to remember at that time, we were now going into low-wing monoplanes, so the British were rearming with the Hurricane and the Spitfire. We had the Brewster Buffalo, we had the P-40, and we were messing around with other uh, designs. The P-38, believe it or not, Greg, also was, was actually a pre-war design. But this airplane's uh, uh, predecessor, the P-39, was uh, one of those as well. Now, the P-39 and the P-63, they, they had basically the same design elements. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to pick up... Greg is obviously skimping on the budget this week, so we have gone to the really teeny tiny uh, airplane here, but this is uh, a good plan view of the P-63. Now, the idea behind the airplane was simple. They were, uh, this was a, a point defense or a pursuit fighter, and the idea was this thing carried a big punch. It carried a 37 millimeter cannon that was bore sighted in the nose, two eyebrow 50 machine guns, and a couple of uh, uh, 50 caliber machine guns on each wing. It could carry an under wing pod as well with additional armament, and it had a, it had a drop tank. Now, the thing that they did about this airplane that is uh, really unique and, and is a testament, you have to remember, I've talked about no computers and doing everything with slide rule, and if an inch is good, two inches is better. What they did with this airplane is just a testament to how ingenious they were. The power plant that uh, Allison engine is actually behind the pilot. The drivetrain goes through his legs, and Greg can probably get a graphic on this, goes through his legs up to where the propeller is at, if you can believe that. Now that, think about the long drivetrain here and remember when, it, it, you know how if you spin a stick really fast, it starts to wobble? It's not balanced really well? Well, imagine that you're providing the drivetrain to this propeller, this big paddle that's up front, and you've got to keep that thing balanced. There's a transmission uh, system in there. There's a series of bearings in there. These things were uh, just incredibly complicated. Now, Greg, I bet you didn't know this. This actually, what Bell learned on these drive shafts, came into something else. What is Bell known for? Not Warbird Wednesday, not the telephone. Bell came into helicopters. And one of the things was that what they learned from the drivetrain on this, they actually put to very good use in later helicopter designs. So the P-39, as it went into the Pacific and it fought against the Japanese, it also fought in the European theater, but uh, it was pretty much outmatched by either the frontline German fighters at the time, uh, the ME-109, which would have been the E or the F model, the G came later, and then, of course, the in the Pacific theater, the primarily the Japanese Zero. Now, the Zero, you got to remember, the uh, European aircraft flew higher. The ME-109s were designed to fly higher. They were also fuel-injected. They were supercharged. The Japanese airplanes, remember we've talked about the Zero, that radial engine was more of a bantamweight fighter, could climb really well, could roll. It didn't do well in a dive against these heavier airplanes because these airplanes were built a little bit heavier. 
carried heavier armament, so they, they could outdive the Zero, but the Zero had the advantage. And what we were doing at that time, in, especially in the Pacific, was just throwing things into the breach to try to, to slow the Japanese down until we could get better models of airplane out there. We've talked about the Hellcat and the Bearcat uh, and the P-51 and the P-47. So this was essentially a stopgap airplane. Now, the designers at Bell, it was also a Lend-Lease airplane that went to the Soviets. The Soviets loved this airplane. Anything we gave the Russians, the Russians put to very good use, whether it was P-40s, B-25s, P-39s, any of the equipment we gave them. You gotta remember, they were in a fight to the death uh, with the Germans, and they were throwing everything they could think of into the line. The other thing about the this airplane, it didn't have terrific range. The P-63, we'll talk about, didn't have great range either. But you have to remember that the Russians were flying off of unimproved airstrips right behind the line, and the line would move, and you know, pretty good every once in a while. And so they did not have as big an issue with range as the Allies did. There goes that. That's our steerman, by the way. If you can pick that up, see it go by. A lot of guys trained in the Stearman to fly these, but the, um, they, they just did not have the range. The Russians didn't matter as much because they were flying close air support in, in either defense or in their offensive capabilities. The Americans, remember, they were doing two things. They were either out in the Pacific flying off, in this case, flying off uh, airstrips on islands and they had to go out over water or they had to cover great distance. Airplane with, with short legs doesn't do that very well for you. And the other thing was in the British theater, in the European theater where they were flying, until we got over into Italy and some in those areas there, what was happening there was, remember, you're flying uh, primarily bomber escort missions into uh, Europe, and you've got to have really long range to be able to do that. So the British had the Spitfires later and the Hurricanes that were doing, uh, by the way, I picked up that British accent, Hurricane. Hurricane. I'm, I'm hanging around the British uh, people too much here. But the, uh, the Hurricane had a um, uh, fairly short, um, uh, or could do fighter sweeps along with the British, and so there really wasn't much need for this airplane in, in that theater. But it did soldier on, suffered pretty good losses at, at that time, but, the, um, but it, it did soldier on. Now, the Soviets said, hey, we really like this, uh, this airplane, but we want to make some design changes to it. And Bell Aircraft, realizing at that point that the, uh, the, this airplane went into a design phase in two early prototypes that were called the XP-39E, uh, but who's quibbling, the 39E, uh, and then it evolved into the XP-63. Now this airplane um, the, is bigger than the P-39 in all respects. It's just larger, larger wing, longer fuselage. I'm going to talk about some of the issues with it. But the this airplane, when it was tested, and this is in the mid-40s, it came in in 1943. It was built around that Allison 1710 engine. So we can talk about that and what that meant. Um, and then it... Um, it but it was bigger and, and heavier based on the Soviet design. Now, why was that, Greg? That was there for a very specific reason in that this airplane... Now, I'm going to talk about something that it's notorious for, and I'm going to talk about something that people don't know about this airplane, and then I'm going to tell you a Fred fun fact that Greg is truly a Fred fun fact. The... The, um, this airplane, if you got this airplane into a flat spin, because of the way the tail was, and you have to remember, when you're talking about aer aerodynamics, you're either trying to get airflow over the aileron, ailerons, the rudder, and the tail, so that you can change the pitch and the roll of the airplane. The change in the airflow is what causes that. If you get an airplane into a flat spin because of the torque, of especially these propeller-driven airplanes, and the airplane starts to spin, they can get very, very, very difficult to get out of. Now, one of the problems when they're spinning is inertia. It starts to spin, and it just feeds off that, off that spin, the, the energy from the spin. 
Now, one way to counteract that is to make a bigger rudder, put more area into the windstream. Uh, or the other thing, and we've shown it on some of these other airplanes, is, and this airplane doesn't have it, but Greg can probably find a picture of a P-63, one of the later P-63s, that they put a strake on the bottom of the airplane, which is basically a fin. And that idea is to put more resistance into the windstream, right? So the airplane won't spin. But this airplane, if you got it into a flat spin, the manual was open the door and get out. You, it was unrecoverable in a flat spin. Now, this unique design, it does not have the air superiority canopy that we've seen in the later P-51s and the P-47. This is, it, it has a good, fairly good vision, but the other thing is, it, what does it have, Greg? It has car doors. So can you imagine you're spinning and you're trying to get out of an airplane, either opening the door into the windscreen, you can pull a pin, the door could come off. There's a way to actually have the door fall off. But as opposed to popping the canopy and falling out of the airplane, if you're trying to get out of this airplane in a flat spin, you're in real trouble. So the Russians, when they looked at the P-39, they liked it. They said, we want more, and they want a bigger airplane, and they want it heavier, which meant more armor and more uh, bulletproof glass and things like that. But the, the thing about it was Andre, and I'm going to screw up this guy's name, Andre Kochakov came over from the Soviet Union, and, and Andre, your family, I hope your family doesn't mind me having, uh, maybe I hope I didn't mess up your name, I hate doing that, but Kachakov, Andre came over and he gave Bell Aircraft a whole bunch of um, design improvements based on the Soviet input from the P-39 in combat. So this airplane, everything from I said, the improved armor, a little bit different visibility, more bulletproof glass in the cockpit, a um, uh, little bit change in the power plant. Now, one thing they, another thing they did was this 37 millimeter cannon. They actually moved it a little bit forward to change the CG, the center of gravity in the airplane, which, by the way, helps in its performance. And the other thing was, is that added the ability to put a little bit more ammo in there. I think it was from 30 to 58. But you got to remember, those are big shells. Those shells are about that big, and so they're just going boom, boom. And if somebody hits you with a 30 millimeter, 37 millimeter cannon shell in the air, it's pretty much game over. Especially in a fighter, they're gonna blow the wing off the airplane. So the Soviets gave all of the um, the input that pretty much went into this airplane. Now he did a lot of flat tests. Uh, or um, flat spin testing in this airplane to the point that he actually bent the airplane. He buckled the fuselage in flat test spinning, trying to pull the airplane out of a, of a flat spin. That's how much they put this airplane through when they were going through the design. At the end of the day, good old Andre said to the engineers, put in the manual, jump out of the airplane. And that was what went in the manual. That's, if you read the manual on this airplane, that's what's in the manual. That actually goes back to Andre's input in the flight test. Now, the interesting thing about that was Andre got a sponsorship from a parachute company as soon as he put that out. So whether Andre was getting uh, uh, some help from the parachute people, I don't know. But Andre basically said, if you get into a flat spin, spin bail out. Now, the airplane had that Allison. Why did it have an Allison? For a couple of reasons. The Rolls-Royce Merlins, well, not really a couple of reasons, one big reason. The Rolls-Royce Merlin was going into what airplane, Craig? The P-51. And because of resources, they decided to go with the Allison, which meant that the airplane's performance at high altitude because of the difference in the superchargers was less. And the Allison, by the way, uh, for the you Allison aficionados, I'm not dissing this engine at all. This is a really, really good American engine. But the reality was 
that it only meant that this airplane at about 21,000 feet could do about 410, 420 miles an hour max speed. If you went up to higher altitudes, which is where those P-51s and those airplanes were operating at, they, they had much better performance envelope, primarily because of the difference in the turbo supercharger. But the airplane had a tremendous gun. So uh, there are only about 3,300 of these built. Um, they, had, they did not have a good internal fuel store. They, as I talked about with legs of this airplane, it inherited that from its, um, from its predecessor. It did not have good internal fuel. Had great armor, great armament, had, could pack a big heavy punch, but uh, did not carry a lot of fuel. Now, it, the other thing about it uh, that was, was kind of interesting, and most people don't realize this, Greg, this was one of or the first all-electric airplane. We have air, electric airplanes now, the, the, the landing gear motors, all the other stuff. This was one of the first airplanes that incorporated a lot of electric servos and, you know, drive parts and all that kind of stuff into the airframe. One of the first. The rest of them were either hydraulic or they were mechanical. This particular airplane, now let's talk about this particular airplane, and then I'm going to get into my salute. Um, the, this particular airplane was a... Um, was the, I believe, the fourth off the line. The third or the fourth off the line with Bell. It went to NACA. We've talked about NACA before. It went to NACA for wind tunnel testing. And then basically when they were done with it, uh, after the war, they rolled it out and it went to seed. It, it started to fall apart. It was sold as surplus and the it became a playground toy. In fact, Greg can probably find the image where you have little stairs up there. Now, the amazing thing about that, and I've seen the picture, and I don't know if Greg can find it, but the armament was still in the airplane. The, the, uh, the, the guns were still in the front of the airplane, but it went uh, as a playground toy for a, for a company, uh, like a company park. That company eventually fell into... Um, into uh, hard times or whatever, the park went away. It was sold. It ended up uh, with uh, commemorative Air Force at one point, and then it came into our collection, I believe, in the in the early '80s. Um, at that point, or somewhere in there, the armament went away. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, and the airplane um, that eventually was restored. Uh, it, we are. This is one of the livery of the pictures that we have of it uh, when it was in the United States. So the livery that we have is fairly accurate. Now people always ask about who is Pretty Polly. This was a Pond aircraft and it still is part of the, uh, the legacy of the Pond. The museum owns this airplane. But uh, Pretty Polly is Polly Pond Holly who is Bob Pond's daughter and we proudly fly with Pretty Polly on the nose of the airplane. And actually if you look on the internet this is probably the most flown and prolific P-63 out there. The commemorative Air Force has one. There's a few others running around. Uh, one of them is uh, in um, uh, pinball colors. What was pinball? Pinball was like a brightly colored uh, airplane that was used for target practice. It was a P-63. It was heavily armed and basically people would come in and shoot at it. That's why they called it pinball. And uh, But I, I actually like this. this. That's why some people ask, well, why is it in Russian colors? Well, in Russian colors because this airplane was actually a flight test airplane. It never left the United States, and so there's, there's just no reason to do that. Now, the airplane as it stands now, we fly it. Um, it does not have the armament in the nose. And if you're sitting at home on uh, YouTube watching this, and you have a 37 millimeter cannon in your front room and the P-63 front armament, give me a call. I would be happy to talk to you about that because what's up there right now is uh, the airplane did not come with a originally with a fire suppression system. We're really getting into geek land here, Greg. Uh, but there's a fire suppression system up there because you can imagine if you had a fire in this airplane, the engine is behind you. You'd have a you might not know the airplane, so there's a fire suppression system up there. This aircraft uh, we fly it quite a bit for air shows, and it it goes up to Reno to give you an idea. 
in a situation like that, an unmodified airplane like this, it's about 20 miles an hour slower than a, uh, a P-51D that is flying up there that's stock. So you could run this thing up to military power. I would not suggest that you do that, by the way. But if you ran it to military power and ran the airplane up there, it is not anywhere near as fast as a stock Mustang, which is very prolific. So the, what I want to do now is I'm going to put down my little demonstrator, and I'm going to go to my stage two. Now, Greg, in keeping, I, I'm really afraid of this one. I am terrified of this one. Greg, this is scary. This is, now this is Lester's fixins. So didn't, wasn't it Melba? Melba's fiction, fixins. Lester's got into the fixins. All right, now Lester created something. I am, man, I'm afraid of this one. This is uh, pumpkin pie soda. In honor of thanks, thank you, Greg, the turkey hat, the, I, maybe the uh, severe case of indigestion. I, and Greg is, you know, you guys don't get it. We're going to make Greg do a cameo one of these days, but he's just saying there is no sell-by date on this. I am using the non-magnetic magnetic can opener that just keeps popping up. So we're going to go ahead and open this. So the stage two today is, and somebody we don't recognize very much, but our allies, the, the Soviets uh, and, and the Russians, um, if they had not, if they had been knocked out of the war, can you imagine uh, how long that war would have gone on, and um, and the, the amount of casualties. I think the Russians suffered somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 million people lost in that conflict. It was a very large number. And um, so I, what I want to do is all those Soviet pilots who were flying under, and they were our allies, flying under really difficult conditions. They were, uh, they, they, they did a good job. They kept us in the war. And the end of the day, they probably wore the Germans down and, and saved a lot of lives. So I want to salute all those uh, lend pilots, all the people that did the air bridge that flew these airplanes out of the United States and flew over Alaska, which was really scary stuff. All the folks that were involved in that, I salute you. God bless you. And by the way, happy Thanksgiving. Well, the last one was apple pie. This is pumpkin pie. It has... It has like a, a spicy finish. Um, it's not awful. It's not something I would drink, but, uh, but it's not something I would drink either. It's something I'm going to set down. But thank you, Greg. In honor of Thanksgiving and to you at home, so there's our pumpkin pie soda and our salute. Now, a couple of other, we're going to do a Fred fun fact, and then we're going to kind of wrap up with our gratuitous product placement. Now, this airplane, believe it or not, and I was blown away by this, because this is complete, complete uh, kismet here. This airplane actually, with the Soviets, uh, survived, on a lend basis, survived the, um, the end of World War II and was actually flying with some uh, Soviet fighter regiments uh, up until the 1950s. And there's actually an account of two P-80s strafing a bunch of P-63s in the Far East that were on some Soviet air base. And it was a big mix-up. Um, and you can go out and read about it. But the bottom line is the United States said they really didn't know that they were supposed that was supposed to happen, so on and so forth. But it caused NATO to give this, every, you know, like the MiG, you know, has like the Fox Bat, and the various uh, airplanes that NATO gives a, a nickname to, right? An allied code name. Kind of like the, the, uh, the Japanese during the war, the, you know, the Betty and those types of things for their airplanes. Greg, do you know what this one is? This code name, NATO code name for this airplane is Fred. Who knew? A Bell airplane with the NATO code name Fred. So... So isn't that kind of cool? I, I, I thought that was kind of cool. So, so this is the code name Fred airplane. Now, uh, it saw one other thing in that about 100 or so of these airplanes were, um, were given to the French. And the P-63s actually flew in Indochina. They flew air support in Indochina. 
they were replaced uh, fairly quickly in the early 50s by, <clears throat> by the, uh, the Bearcats that were given to the French, and then they kind of just play, they went on into history. But, uh, and then they kind of fell into affectionado hands. They were in some, there were some really dedicated air racers at one time that actually flew these. They cut the wings down and did some other things. But the airplane, other than uh, a couple of the, um, the museums, the flying museums operating them, they've, they've kind of gone into history. Now, if you want to get your King Cobra Fred shirt, we should get the image with Fred across it, and code name Fred. But the, uh, the King Cobra, the P63 shirt, this is a Stan Stokes image, by the way. It's just a fantastic image. It was originally done for when we uh, air race the airplane up at Reno. Uh, you can pick that up on our web store. And there's also, if you want to get your Allison on, your Allison engine on, there's a great shirt that is uh, also wears the uh, the P63 that is uh, also featuring the Al Allison. So that is very, very cool. This is one of those airplanes, as I said, it's a flying airplane in our collection. It is a unique airplane. You will not see very many of these flying. So I encourage you to come over to the museum and check it out. What I want to do is, as I said, we're filming just before Thanksgiving from our family to yours. God bless you. And may you all have a, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We all have a lot to be thankful for. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks for visiting us. Have a great day.